Wow, we're back again. Wow. Guess who's back? You know, it's only been two days and I just couldn't, I couldn't stop, you know, longing to talk with Pete here. My great friend, Peter Freeman from Crunch Time Coaching. Uh, really appreciate Pete coming back on again. And we've got a great session for you uh, to talk about what not to copy when watching Roger Federer. And uh, first off, before I continue my intro spiel, I just want to Thank you, Pete, for coming on once again to provide a lot of value to our audience and to, to talk about tennis. I love it. Guess who's back? Shady's back. Have you heard I of know that song? song? You know that? Okay. Well, I figured you'd know that one because you know hip hop. But the only reason why I'm back is I wanted to stump you one more time. Well, you'd know Guys, if you've been paying attention, Maribon knows nothing about music that's like older than 10 years ago. Like he just, he just doesn't know any of it. We played Billy Joel, a classic Billy Joel song, Pressure. He had no idea what that was. We played Let's Go Crazy by Prince. No idea. We played the Chicago Bulls theme song. No idea. So I'm predicting there's no way in the world he's going to know this, but it's an iconic hit. I'll just tell you this right now, Mirabon. Are you ready to play? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. All right, here it goes. Let's see if he knows this one. He doesn't know it. Uh, he has no clue. Let me get my SoundCloud. Where's my SoundCloud? <laughs> I, I have no idea. I've heard no it. No idea. Can I get a quarter credit? Because I've heard this. You've heard it before? You at least recognize the lick? Yeah. That was Jack and Diane by John Cougar Mellencamp. Or sometimes he's just John Cougar. Sometimes he's Cougar. Sometimes he's yeah. Mellencamp. I don't know what he is, but he was a huge rock star like a country type rock star. Wow. And that was a big iconic hit and you don't even know what it is. So what a cool name. They should call you Peter the lion. That'd be cool. Peter the lion. Yeah. Yeah. But a yeah, uh, great song. Just, just once again, showing that I am old and you are young. So it's like, I'm insulting you, but really it's just cause I'm jealous. I, I wish I didn't know that song. That's what I really wish. Yeah. It, it happens with all of us. It's all relative. I mean, I'm getting up there mid thirties. Uh, so. Um, but yeah, <laughs> everybody, uh, look at that. Saul knew it. Dave yeah. knew it. They all knew wow. it. Wow. They all knew it. I'm just highlighting everybody here. And Ollie's okay, what did, you say? did you say John Cougar or, or Jack and Diane or was it both? It's Jack and Diane is the name of the song by John Cougar or John Cougar Mellencamp. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, guys, um, we have a session, as I mentioned, on what not to copy when watch watching Roger Federer. And it's really important um, because I know there's obviously been a movement to, to essentially copy other pros and what they're doing. And sure, of course, like there's a lot of aspects that are excellent to copy. These are the greatest players in the world. But, um, you know, depending on your skill level and where you're at, I mean, it, it certainly may not help and actually hurt to copy certain aspects of great players as well. And so that's why. I brought on Pete and Pete, you know, he's just so happy to hop on live. He's just on live all the time, which I just love it. So you got to check out his YouTube channel uh, at Crunch Time Coaching. But so he's coming on to talk to us about, again, what not to copy when watching the great, the legendary Roger Federer. And I apologize in advance to all the Fed fans. I'm a Fed fan too, but, um, you know, we're, we're not trying to, to speak heresy to you all. We're just uh, trying to show you exactly what you need to Copy him from Federer, from Roger uh, Federer, and also what to avoid copying, especially if you're at the 3-0, 4-0, letter level or below, maybe even if you're a 5-0, because there's certain things that that uh, Roger's doing that is, you know, we it's not the best thing for us. So, Pete, uh, what are your thoughts? And uh, I'll let you take it away from here for a bit before I comment. Yeah, absolutely. So I really like um, this topic because Roger Federer makes the game look so easy, easy. It's so easy to get swept up and say, I want to play like that. Oh, my God, it's so beautiful. And and you would think that you'd want to copy almost everything he does because his technique is so beautiful and he's got great fundamentals. So this is certainly not to say you don't want to copy anything that Roger Federer does. In fact, what I'm going to go through here tonight is I'm going to tell you what you do want to copy, the do's and the don'ts. I just thought we just thought the email title might be a little more catchy. You're like, don't do this because everybody's like, I want to play like Roger. So <laughs> um, hopefully that's what got you on excited. So first of all, let's go with a do. All right. I think that you do want to copy 
Roger Federer's grips. I think that they are good grips where, and especially for, for people who maybe were a little more in the continental, it's not as severe where you're moving over to a big, you know, semi-Western, aggressive semi-Western or Western grip. Roger Federer on his forehand plays with an Eastern grip. And, but the way he angles his racket, you know, he really gets a lot of spin because the way he faces his racket down. So you do want to copy his grip and you definitely want to copy his backswing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and Maribon, come on and let me know if, the, if, if it doesn't look good when I start sharing my screen, like stop me. But if the video looks good, I want to show people so a, a great thing that you want to copy that I talk about all the time and he does it so beautifully. So um, this is something you definitely want to copy. We're going to share the screen right here. So sharing the screen. Appreciate Boom. you sharing, Pete. Uh, I'm daring. I'm going okay. crazy. I'm going big on the last night. Uh, you are see here. All right. Oh. And sh how, how's it? How okay, cool. There it is. It's up there. And um let's come on over here okay so this is the video better can mm -hmm. you see it pretty good marabon yes sir okay and i'm gonna blow up the screen so we can see it nice and big and beautiful thank you this is from, this is from love tennis of course it's stuck okay this is from love tennis uh that's that's top tennis training in disguise by the way i figured that out mm. uh, so anyway watch his preparation so when when roger sees the ball See how he's see how he holds on to that racket in his first move. And, and Rick Macy talks about this all the time. And Rick has been given credit with the AT, ATP forehand blueprint. And, and Roger Federer is the one who says he's explained it the best out of anybody. So look how he's making that unit turn and look how strong he uses that off arm. And, and what I love about this is you can see the racket slightly facing the ground. So the ball is not going to fly on him. And I love how the arm just gets straighter and more pronounced. I like to call this the measuring stick. And when I do video analysis on people's forehand, it's amazing that people probably have seen this look a million times, yet barely anybody uses their offhand. And by doing this, he is loading up his core. He's creating his spacing. He does not want the ball to be coming under his arm. He wants it to be coming outside of the hand. So you really get the ball away from you. Lots of people let the ball come in too close to their body. So you can also use this measuring stick to measure out how far the ball should be away. So his preparation is amazing. And also, as Rick talks about, just so you guys can understand, Rick talks a lot about be, the keeping the racket on the hitting side of the body. And what that means is that his racket stays out here to his right side. It's not going to come back behind the fence. And uh, and so watch, it comes out there and then down. You can see how his strings are facing towards the ground, which a lot of people don't have their strings facing this. So even though he's in an Eastern grip, look at how he faces those strings down to the ground. You would, you would almost think, well, he must have a, a semi-Western or or full Western grip to be facing it that much to the ground. Look how long the arm stays engaged here. This is just incredible how the discipline he has. And now again, that arm's still engaged. And, and now he's going to start to use all this rotation here. And look at the strings facing the ground, up through the ball and around, and a beautiful hit. So his fundamentals on his forehand – and, and I love how, you know, when he's out there in the practice court, lots of times he'll catch the racket in the other mm -hmm. hand, which is another solid fundamental play. So those are like check, 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 do, 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 do. That's Those are all some great things that you do want to do. We'll come back to Maribon. I'll stop sharing my screen and see what he thought about that. Did that, did that play through pretty well? Play it through very well. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, in the future too, if you drag it a little bit, it might even show more frames because sometimes it's like wonky with, but we saw like, you know, pretty much like the, the main stroke of it, uh, main part of it. But yeah, with the stroke, uh, the forehand in particular, I wanted to ask you, Pete, you know, you talked about using the left hand to rotate, which really, like you said in our last live stream too, it automatically, you look like a pro player, right? As soon yeah. as you're doing that, uh, maybe I'll put it on wide here. Um, but anyway, I was wondering how much of a rotation should we actually be doing, you know, or how far should we be going, you know, like uh, before it's like too much for us. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you want you can go pretty far, but you want to make sure you keep the hands out to the side. 
So let me just show you guys. So, um, and then I think for most of us, like we can't go far enough because we think we're doing, we think we're doing a big deal and then we're not turning enough. So um, you want a big turn, but you want to make sure, see, like I'm really twerking this all up, but I'm not going like this, which a lot of people do. And that now basically be on the, the other side. So you want to make sure that you're really twisting your body up, but you're keeping everything out, out here. Okay. Like, like Roger does. And Mark Kovacs, who presented on this, he actually gave me a, le a lesson on the forehand. And one thing I never heard anybody say before is he wanted to like me to think of my hips, like a Coke bottle, like, like you're, you know, like a Coke bottle cap and really screwing it in there. So you can really feel like you're twisting right? You're making a bottle cap out of your hips and really twisting yourself up and loading yourself up. When I took a lesson from Rick Macy, he did an interesting thing where he had me set and he's like, okay, now don't swing till I tell you to swing. And then he throw me a ball and, and I couldn't swing until he said, until he said swing. And then the ball would go by me. He'd never say swing. And he was really messing with my mind. And, and, and the reason why I was doing that is because even though I was showing this really nice preparation, he felt I was coming out of it too soon where I wasn't getting the benefit of being all locked up. So like this can be for show, but if you come out of it too early, then all of a sudden you lose all the momentum. You know, the more you can really stay here loaded and then start to really unload there to hit the ball, you're going to get more of that torque in the, into your shot and, and feel that release of power. Love it, Pete. Very good stuff here. We got some nice questions. So do you want me to uh, ask a, a few to you or is that breaking your momentum here? I said no questions. Of course they can ask questions, Marabon. That's why they're here. Pete pleads the fifth. I'm his, att his attorney and um, sorry, no questions. No, uh, let's see. So, okay, we've got, um, when does he break his wrist? Interesting question there. Is it the racket drop or what is that? This is, this is a great question because... One thing is, is, is a lot of people think about, you know, when you watch the pros and it's so spinny, you, you, you know, I see a lot of people like on the courts, like really trying to risk the ball and think that they're, that's where they're going to get their spin from. The, the spin comes from Roger keeping his racket frame down and, and coming up and under the ball. And, and here's the cool thing. Here's one of my favorite tennis racket. Can you tell what a great tennis racket this is? This <laughs> bottle of- Don't uh, throw it. Please don't throw it, okay? Yeah. So, so anyway, the cool thing is if, if you get, here's the way you can kind of cheat and, and get yourself into like the wrist lag. Um, you don't have to do it just like Federer and just like the pros to really get the same benefit, okay? So this isn't exactly what they do, but, it, but it's going to help your forehand a lot. So notice how my racket is flexed up. Now, once I do this, guys, I'm done. And I'm done for a while. Then I come here and I'm set and then I relax down. And then as I come, I just relax a little more. Now this stays engaged up into the hit. See that the wrist, it really isn't doing much right up into, see if you're trying to add stuff before you hit, this is where you see club players do. And then they got the big elbow like that. That's not what the pros are doing. Their wrist is pretty clean and pretty still. Now they're not holding it tight. It's just relaxed coming up, but it's staying, it's like locked, but not like locked tight. Okay. It's just allowing the racket to go up and hit the ball. And then once they come here and the ball is gone, this is when they start to turn over the wrist to the follow through. Excellent question. Excellent question here. All right. Oh, interesting one on the, I thought I had a back. Oh yes. From Azim. So we'll highlight it here. What no back end questions yet? He pleads the fifth again. Crazy. No backhand questions yet. We're not there. Oh, no, no backhand questions yet. Sorry, Azim. We can't we can't go there yet. Uh, let's see. Any more questions about the forehand? Um, not yet. So you know what, Pete? Let's go for your next tip. Okay. So the next one, I'm going to do another do, and then we're going to go into a don't. We're going to go two, two do's and then a don't. So I'm going to share the screen again. And here we go. Working hard on a Tuesday night for you. It's Wednesday night, isn't it? <laughs> is it Wednesday night, Marabon? You are working too hard. Yes, it is Wednesday night. Can you pop that up there for me, buddy? Yes, sir. You're so good at that. I am. I, I press buttons real well. They train me well. Okay, now this is going to be a real learning experience here because 
I notice a lot of people do not do this on the backhand. Um, so here maybe is a don't. Uh, I, I like it overall, but I mean, look how high that racket frame is, okay? So I don't know if we need to be that high. This could be difficult because this has got to drop under the ball. And I find a lot of people when they start hitting topspin cannot drop under the ball. What I like about it is, again, he looks pretty relaxed. I mean, the preparation is perfect, okay? But it can be a little tough for some people in the beginning to have the wrist this much up and then to drop it. So I don't know if you need to be this much extreme up. So this is like a little bit of a maybe don't do that. OK, mm. I'm not saying not to do it, but it's a maybe don't. And you have to really find what works for you. And when I when we come back and I kind of show you uh, visually my my body, uh, you can uh, you can kind of make up your own mind, see what I'm talking about. So that's like a maybe don't. Now, here's one thing that is a do coming up. So uh, watch this. Look how relaxed he is, too. It's beautiful. Yeah. Now, look at that. You guys see that the way his racket um, came and basically faced us. I want to go back again and show that right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now um, I'm going to come back and stop sharing my screen because that's a big deal right there, what I just showed you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So lots of people who have weak topspin backhands. They have a they have what I call a weak grip, okay. To where uh, let's use this like this is <laughs> everything's a racket to me. These can be like like bevels, okay. These can be like bevels, okay. And here's the top of your racket, the top bevel, the top bevel right there. And lots of people are kind of weak. They have their knuckles more down the racket here, and then when they go to hit, their wrist is in a weak, really weak position. And they kind of like fling it. Like I had one guy in our 30 day challenge. This was basically his backhand, like exactly. So you want to bring that knuckle a little more up to the top, like you're at a motorcycle grip. Now that's going to automatically look what that's doing. That's getting the wrist to go up. Okay. That's getting the wrist to go up. And then, like I was talking about before, you might want to decide like how high, the higher the wrist is like this, the more you're set like this, the rack's going straight up. And then you've got to really work to bring it down. You know, or it, or it might be a long way for you to travel. You know, you might not be able to get this there fast enough, even though it looks really cool. So you might want to just be a little more like this, not as not as high up. Play with it and see where you're at, where you can still have like a little bit of a nice little racket drop and come up on the ball. But you got to get beneath that ball before you go. Now, the thing that is a game changer that you need to do, I know is lots of people on their back end. This is what's different about the one-hander topspin compared to any other stroke uh, as far as when we're hitting topspin. Like the, the forehand we've talked about, you're out here to the side and we wanna keep on the, the hitting side and hit. The two-handed backhand, you're here, you're out to the side and then you do a little bit of a drop and the racket might dip a little bit behind you on the other side, but not much and then you're going. You can see all the really good one-handers there's a clear delineation to where they bring it and it's facing on the opposite side of their body and their strings are facing towards the fence. So a drill that I like to have people do to get this going is actually just hold the racket here with your off hand. You got the ball machine coming or you have someone pitching you balls underhand. That's a great way to practice. And you're just waiting here. And then when the ball comes, it, you, you pull your hand back and then just go. So you can get in that habit of, of feeling that. So that's a big do that a lot of people don't. I like it, Pete. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, it's a great tip because it's really important for us to be able to get relaxed enough and to get the racket drop. I was actually, um, I forget who was actually talking about this, but they were mentioning that on the two-hander, for, for example, a lot of people, they actually like, you know, start hitting before they get the racket drop. And so that's um, that's going to really um, take away a lot of the potential topspin that you could hit. So um, appreciate that tip there. That's really good. Yeah. I see that somebody is saying it's kind of a small room to use an actual racket. I guess people are maybe saying I should be using a racket. But 
hey, everything's a racket to me. And you're right, it's a little too small room. And I don't I don't have my little junior racket with me right now. I should have had my junior racket available and ready to roll. Um, but I have been playing tennis with us all week, Maravon, just so you know. Yeah, uh, that's how okay. good he is. That's how, that's how good I am. Or, or just kind of crazy and insane in the quarantine. Okay, now we're going to go through the backhand slice. All right? And this is where we're going to have the first big don't do this. Let Roger do this, and you don't even mess with it, okay? okay. Unless you're like a, a real gifted, talented player, and you've got amazing feel in your hands, and you're probably like four or five plus, plus, plus. I don't recommend this. So let me show you by sharing the screen again. If Maribon could put the screen up there. Yes. There we go. Okay, we're like rolling. We are like a team. Okay, so I absolutely love Roger's preparation on the slice. Okay, he's in the continental grip. Hopefully this thing will get there. Okay, cool. I love his first move. This is a huge do. This is a huge do right here. Look at this first move. It is beautiful, and a lot of people don't get this. And, and, and look at the way he gets this up here. And it's like, and maybe that's a little too high for some people though. So maybe that's a little, again, a little minor don't. He does bring it kind of way up, maybe not this high. Like Roy Emerson was more across the shoulders. So you might want to do the same move and be more across the shoulders. But he does something that I call a racket jut. He juts the butt out to the side. And this is a big power move. And I'll show you again when I come back on camera that a lot of recreational players never use. And look how the racket face is. It's like he could lean back and it looks kind of like a, a headrest, like if he's on a plane. Like that's what you want right there. This is a obviously beautiful preparation. And, and Roger's slice is, is incredibly beautiful to watch. That's why it's so alluring and you might want to do it. But watch how he comes really down on this ball and just across it. And this is just like Roger Federer being, you know, a tennis god, basically, with amazing feel, and he can get away with this. I don't know if this is going to work out the same way for you. You see that? Look how yep. look how swiping out there and low and open. You yeah. know, I'm telling you, 95% of recreational players trying to do that are going to make that ball float, flutter, and it's not going to be a knifing, biting slice like we know Roger can hit. Okay. So I'm going to come back and show you uh, why I don't like that and what I'd like you to do instead. That was my next question. Excellent. Yeah. Like a mind reader. You're you're a mind reader, buddy. Okay, you so you, you can stop sharing the screen, or okay. I do I remove it? That's right. Okay. Okay. So let's just a couple of things. Again, the racket. Jut the butt. This is a this is a big move right, right here. I, I love that. A lot of people will get will will get here on their slice, and they wonder why they can't really get any pop on it because from right here it just becomes like a push. Up here you can really like knife into the ball. Okay, and when you first start developing a slice, I want you to think about it as a volley off the bounce. If you're thinking of a slice with the quotation word slice in your head. You're going to hit that floater junk thing and be completely frustrated. It's not going to be a quality slice like you're seeing on TV where the ball stays low and hits the ground and skids and stays low. That's that's what you want to hit, okay? But if, if you are here and you're going, you're, you're going to end up floating a lot of it. you you got to get here to get that going. And then you want to think of it like a volley off the bounce to where you want to actually have pretty solid contact with the ball. You don't want to be making contact like this. See, if, here's here's my here's a racket right here, my phone. You don't <laughs> want to be making contact like this. Then the ball is going to go up. And the way Roger's going and just doing this across his body, you know, if you're trying to do that, what what usually ends up happening is you end up usually coming like this. See, you're already too open and going like that, and then your ball's like got like the sideways spinny thing. And it might be able to fool some of the people some of the time, like at a low 3 three o or even 3-5 level, it can have like a little voodoo action on it. But once you get up to like a 4-0, 4-5 level, people are just going to start crushing it. They're, they're going to read that. It's not yeah. going to fool them. 
Yep. So if you want to develop like a proper slice, what you want to do is be very good at being solid with the contact. And then I like to really think about carrying out a wave. Like how long can I be on the wave if I'm a surfer? I like to ride out the swing path as long as possible out to the target, right? This is the way to do it, in my opinion, for more control because now you're you're going through the hitting zone a lot longer as opposed to coming to the hitting zone than coming there. Most people don't have the timing to stay with it enough to where it's going to knife through. Roger can feel that. Even though Roger looked like he's coming over here, he's put enough force through the ball to go. And that just takes a lot of talent. It, it are, the chances of us – increase a lot, the more we can stay with the line of the ball and push through it. Then we can get more of a driving slice that stays low. Awesome, Pete, 100%. I'm yeah, done. it's, it's, it, yeah, I mean, this is really important. And that's why, you know, you really have to know what to copy and what not to, because, um, you know, that the way that Pete described where Roger, he goes to the side, um, that's, that's more likely to really um, bring forth uh, these You guys hear me? Am I gone? Is he gone? Oh, no. We lost Aaron. Maybe we lost me. Hey, we're Wait, back. Second, come back on, guys. I'm not sure. We're back, right? All right, anyways, I think we're back, right? Just If you guys can see me, then uh, let me know. Okay, I'm back. Are you back? We lost. Did we lose you or did we lose me or what happened? I think we lost me and then we lost you. So uh, does it look like we're good? <laughs> well, you're kind of frozen. You're kind of like a space. Wow. Right All right. Now. You know what? We're going to you then. But no, I was just saying basically that I appreciate that example because when, when I played four or five and four players who uh, floated these backhand slices, then it was just I had so much time to just destroy them. And so it's really important. And uh, conversely, really effective if you can develop the type of slice that Peter talked about. Because when I play these players who can hit these biting slices, like low to my backhand especially, that's a huge weapon. So um, that's a great tip, Pete. I really appreciate that. And uh, can you see me now? Am I looking okay? You look great. Oh, my gosh. You came back a better looking man. Thank you. Thank you. I just did my hair a bit when I, while I was out. But uh, let's uh, – then thanks for confirming, everybody. So, Pete, what's your next uh, tip for us in terms of either a do or a don't? We're going back to the do's. Roger, my list, Roger has more do's than don'ts, a lot more do's, okay? And he's paid his do's. All right, so a big do, which is great, is Roger's ability to relax when hitting. This is, this is just something, I don't know if he's worked on it or if it just comes natural, but... Roger's able to – his racket, by the way, is so heavy. And yeah. he does not look like a big, burly dude. And he swings that thing around like a magic wand because he's just so relaxing. He's letting his body do most of the work rather than making his arm do a lot of the work. Okay? And that's by just not having much tension in the shoulders and in, in, in his whole body. Even though he's playing with a lot of intensity and a lot of focus – He's able to relax. And this is what Rick Macy kind of says, like the, is, is the golden magic ticket that both that the elite players are able to do that players like me were not able to do. Like he said, Pete, I can tell intensity is right in your wheelhouse and you're a hard worker and you got talent, but I couldn't relax enough. And, and um, you know, I, I feel a lot of tension. Like even when I'm doing these live streams, I'm always a little nervous. Like I love doing them, but I do get nervous. And, and, it, and so, you know, but um, Jeff Greenwald probably gave me one of the best thing exercises to do for somebody who's not naturally relaxed. And that is to work on the tension dial when you're out in the, when you're out in the practice court, you have to do on the practice court first, and then you can start to do it in your matches. And so like you can turn the ball machine on, and you can work up and down the tension dial. So starting, you can either you can either start loose or start tight. It doesn't matter. But let's just say I'm going to start tight. And so I'm going to start hitting with like a death grip here on the racket, holding the racket extremely tight, 
holding it and feeling what that feels like to be at a 10 hitting and how tight it is and, and how the ball is taken off my racket and then go down to, to an eight and still pretty tight. And then, and then a six and then a four, see that? And then like a two and a one. And now all of a sudden, you know, you can feel the difference and it's a good way when you do this to go up and down the tension dials, when you play a match, you can be more self-aware. You can be like, oh my gosh, I'm getting up to around a seven and eight. I'm getting too tight, you know, and then you can start to do some relaxation drills. Another great relaxation drill that Jeff Greenwald gave me, who's a great sports psychologist, one of the best players over 50 in the world, literally. He's won a lot of gold balls, a lot of national titles. And he says, if you're tight and you're nervous, Go with that tension. Hold the racket like as you're walking back and get going to the fence. See, right now as I'm doing all this and preparing me, picking up a ball, I'm holding this like I want to squeeze a hole right in it. And and but then when I go and I I play, now all of a sudden, all of a sudden my shoulders are relaxed. Everything's relaxed. And so for those first couple balls, I'm gonna be loose. So that's a great way to start to learn to relax like Roger. Pete, what's the ideal uh, number, you know, on a one to 10 scale for uh, where we want to be on the terms of the relaxation scale? And is that number the same for everybody? That's a great question. Like Jeff Greenwald was saying, no, it's not the same for everybody. He's like, you know, like he says, maybe Roger's about a two, you know, and, and Rafa is probably about a, a four. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think when you're getting around an eight or a nine, you're too tight. But I think anything six and below is good. One for most people is probably going to be a little too loose. You're probably going to start spraying balls. Um, so it works differently for everybody. I think what you want to do is experiment on the ball machine or when you're hitting out in practice and say, okay, I'm going to be hitting for these next five minutes at a 10, then at an eight. Like really use it a lot. Don't do the exercise once or twice so that you really start to understand your body and what it feels like and what you like the most. And then that's your ideal tension. Nice. Perfect idea. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, oh, uh, let's see. Paul was asking, is he using a continental grip on his slice? Yes. Mm -hmm. I believe so standard grip. What's that? I believe so. You believe so? I believe so as well. It's a standard I believe. slice. I believe. You're a believer. Wow. Okay. I'm a, I'm a believer. Interesting. <laughs> um, is there, by the way, is there any variation for the, the slice? I mean, on the grip, like is, we all know continental is a proper grip, but, um, you know, can we go uh, uh, one way or the other as well and still hit a good slice? Yeah, you can. I mean, I think you want to be somewhere around the continental. I, I think, you know, some people I see, they're actually in an Eastern backhand grip and like they don't change their grip between a topspin backhand and a slice. And that's just not going to work. So you yeah. definitely don't want to be like in a topspin Eastern grip. Yeah, you know, that's when it just gets really ugly. It's when you're kind of hitting your slice like this. It's just... Yeah, don't do it. Yeah. How about this one? Uh, you can check your relaxation by dropping your shoulders. Is that? Yeah. That's a good one. John Newcomb talks about this a lot. Breathing. Yeah. 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 I do yeah. that sometimes when Pete uh, hangs up on me. I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Pete, <laughs> please go on before I uh, make everyone leave here. Yes. I was, I was going to say so. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> now. The next thing you don't want to copy about Roger Federer, and I really saw this at the Australian Open, I thought, man, this guy is becoming, what's kind of weird is Roger is getting older, but he's doing more impossible things as he gets older. Like he's playing where only he can play this type of tennis. And I've noticed he's been doing this more and more and more. Because he does not want long points. Like, I think even one match at the um, Labor Cup, he was in trouble. And then Rafa and him agreed, like, okay, we got to keep the points under, like, three balls. And so Roger's court position, as beautiful as he's able to make it look, when I watched on Rod Labor Arena, I'm like, this guy is insane. It's like a kamikaze plane. So, like, what I notice now, if you watch a lot of the pros – They'll serve, and then you'll see them work themselves back and get a little behind the baseline and, and, and play the point. And especially you'll see, like, you know, Novak, you know, one shot will be here, another shot will be way back here, and maybe run across a little bit. 
and then just work his way back in, then maybe get there. Roger serves, and he stands like right there. It's crazy. He stands right there, yeah. and he basically dares his opponents because the serve is so good, and he just plays the percentages as far as for him, knowing how talented he is. He's like, if you can hit here and you can hit here, I'm going to give you that is basically what Roger says. He's basically banking on you're going to hit it here and allow me to attack on the forehand. And even if you hit it right at my feet, my hands are so good. My hand eye is so good that I can basically scoop it off off my shoelaces like no problem. Where when I watch recreational players, one of the biggest mistakes they make, and I see this all the time, and let me know if this is you, you serve and you stand inside the court like this. And then somebody hits a deep return and you go like this and then you miss. Okay, that's what I've seen all the time, 3-5 and 3-0. So for players playing, I recommend you really be aware of your court position. And unless you like, if you hit a bomb serve, if you like crush the serve, you can you can cheat inside a little bit. But if you just have like a serve to get in play or you notice that when you go to hit it, it's a little bit of a weaker serve, you've got to hit the ball and get behind the baseline so you have a guarantee that you can step into your first shot. See, if, if I serve the ball, and, and let me just move this a little closer. If, if I serve the ball, and then I get back there, at least I have a guarantee to step into the first shot. I have a guarantee if I'm back here to step into the ball. If I'm in here and someone gets at my shoelaces, I don't have the reaction time, the talent, the feel that I'm still going to be able to hit an offensive shot and stay stay in charge of the point. So that is a big one. That that might be number one. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let Roger do that. Pete, where is that from? What, what? character is that? Is that I, is that it's like it's like my it's my New York. It's my jersey. It's like don't do that. Come on. <laughs> Very you nice. Know. I think you, sh- you you they got to get you on TV, Pete. I mean, you're really multi talented. You're streaming every day. I mean, you're you're something there. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, also just a question for you. I mean, we see Rafa standing super far back, like on returns and so far. Is there like um, any sort of limit to uh, how far back we should stand? Well, I think I think that's a great observation. What you just made there, Mary Bond, is, is Rafa right. will stand like way back there. And, and for most of the people um, who are going to return, you don't need to be standing way back there against the people that serving against you. You know, Rafa is returning 140 mile an hour bombs and he's also fast enough to cut off angles. Okay. So even if somebody hits an out wide serve, he can get there where one of the things that I noticed that there is something you should change. Remember you want to guarantee, you want to have a guarantee most of the time that the ball, that you can step in the balls in front of you. Now, a lot of people have been taught, like, you return serve here. So they'll return here, serve here for the first serve. And then the second serve comes, and they stand here, and I've seen the double bounce serve. Boop, boop, and they don't even get to it. So, you know, really pay attention to your opponent and what they're capable of. Like, if you get one where it bounces twice in front of you, I'm going to forgive you. If that happens twice to you in a match, you're not seeing things, right? Mm -hmm. So – for, for, for most people you're going to serve against, your second serve, you should be standing somewhere in here and you still have plenty of room because the ball's got to bounce here. You still have enough time to step into the ball. And then after you hit this, don't stand here. Make sure you get back to here or you can hit and come to the net. Yeah, yeah. Footwork is just so important. You know, we, we think uh, a lot about our stroke technique and everything, and that's super important, but the positioning, the footwork is going to make so much uh, of a difference, you know, and strategy wise, and even, even it even affects the technique, right? You know, like your footwork determines whether you can get in position properly so you can execute the rest of the technique as well. So um, yeah, good stuff there, Pete. Appreciate that. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, We've got uh, a great crowd on actually tonight. This is pretty amazing. Yeah, you guys yeah. are awesome. It's been a solid, solid week or two, I think. Um, let's see. What do we have? Oh, interesting. Yes. Footwork is everything. That's true. So Jamie, uh, with the kind comment earlier, is asking, there's nothing wrong with having technique that's more WTA than ATP, right? I am female. My forehand does break the plane a, a bit, for example. So what are your thoughts on that, Pete? Well, first of all, 
Yeah, I mean, we're always trying to compare ourselves to Federer, to Djokovic, to you know these players, and there's a lot of of tennis players who break the plane, who could just destroy all of us. Okay, yeah. so I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with with having a Maria Sharapo beforehand. I mean, you know, it's one at the highest level, um, but. I will agree with 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 Rick Macy. He says, you know, when you have time, if you're if, if the level of competition you're playing against gives you the time to take it back and break the plane, then you can. You know, if you've got the time in and you can go out there and do it. But the reason why it's changed so much, and I think that the WTA forehand and the ATP forehand, that's almost becoming dated, right? I think that was more like a a five, 10 years ago comparison, things change. A lot of the WTA ladies, they, they have, you can call it ATP or you can just call it, you know, why even put, uh, it, it's just been labeled so much that I say it too, you know, ATP, because this is so catchy and everybody knows what you're talking about. But it's just a, an evolution of the forehand. And, and most of the ladies right now too are doing the same thing where they're keeping everything on the hitting side because the game's gotten faster. So if you're not playing people where this is exposed, it doesn't matter. If you have great, if you're here, but otherwise you got great timing and great technique, it's not going to hurt you. But if you're playing somebody who's got superior technique and superior speed and they keep getting ready here and putting the ball on you really fast and you keep trying to get ready back here, well, you know, you're going to lose that battle. So, and, and which, which incidentally, Maria Sharapova's strokes kind of started to go out of style. Her game started to go out of style. She started to not be able to out hit these people like she could earlier. The game was getting faster. The opponents were getting faster than her. And she she wasn't just able to outpower people. And most people hit harder than she did towards the end and were faster than her. So that's what kind of happened to her. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, as we talked about before, Pete, it's really all about, you know, first at the outset, kind of figuring out your your ultimate goal in your tennis career and where you want to be at. And then you let that guide what parts of your game you have to improve. And so if, you're, if your goal is maybe to be like a, a very good 4-0 or 4-5 or player, even 5-0, I mean, you can get away with not having the perfect technique or the most optimal technique. Uh, and maybe it's more important for you to focus on strategic things or maybe like a more important flaw in your your backhand, for example. Um, so it's certainly not something that you have to necessarily obsess over uh, or change even if it uh, if you don't need to for where you want to get to. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Great stuff. Let's see if we have any. I mean, we have a lot of comments here. Oh, yeah. So uh, Pyro or Piro, I apologize if I pronounce it incorrectly. Um, and we have a lot of this in the uh, all access fast, but w just asking, since I play tennis, what tennis things can I do to keep my tennis level up during this time? And so there's been a lot on the summit. So, but what are some things that we can do, uh, Pete, that are your particular favorites? Well, I think the big thing we've been doing a lot in my 30 day tennis technique and fitness challenge. And after this marathon, we're going to go into a 14 day tennis terminator challenge to, cause my members loved it and I asked them, what, what do we want to do next? And so we're going to do a backhand um, mastery challenge. We're going to do a picture perfect challenge, which is one of the big things you should do. And we're going to do a fitness and weight loss challenge. So guys be looking out for that. Okay. Maybe even Maribel would be nice enough to send a little shout out on that. So you guys know it's coming. But um, so that's, that's a big thing you should be doing. And, and, one of the big things you could be working on is your footwork, just like we talked about. Everybody said footwork is everything. Footwork is everything, but especially the technique of it, okay? Lots of people work really hard with their feet, but it's not good footwork technique. And so one of the things that I have as a do is do copy his footwork because as I watched him at the um, Australian Open, I was just in awe of how fast he was. OK, that's one thing. He was so fast. You cannot believe how fast he still is, how he just moves like the wind. And you can see him. It still looks smooth, but you can see like, oh, he's working out there. Like lots of times on TV, you don't really appreciate how much he's working. Like he is working. Like when that point starts, he is on it. OK, 
And the biggest thing though, but that doesn't necessarily mean footwork, right? He's just, he's just hustling. That's different. But the biggest thing that you can copy is to really focus the time. His split step was perfect every time. Like his timing of when the opponent was getting ready to go in and hit the ball. Roger always had that split step and his legs were always outside of his shoulders where other people who split step lots of times they're very narrow and they're, they're hopping, they're working hard, they're trying to do all the right things. But since you're so narrow and your feet are together, even though the hot, you're not going to be as explosive going out there. You know, Roger's wide. So when he lands, he's gone, you see. And that's a big thing that you want to copy is, is work on the timing of your split step and have a wide base. And that way you can explode and go. Awesome, Pete. And uh, I inadvertently put a bad word in the chat. Whoops. Um, so <laughs> I just, instead of this, I wrote something else with the same letters. Um, <laughs> don't read that. So uh, Zorada is asking, what makes Federer, uh, sorry, Federer's footwork so effortless? He moves as well as or better than anyone on the tour, but he doesn't look like he tries hard at all. I mean, what is that? Is that a lot of hard work and really good um, training? What is it? Well, it reminds me of a guy I used to talk, teach who um, made the Olympic trials for skeet shooting. Hmm. And he says, when you shoot 100,000 rounds, the natural talent just oozes right out of you. <laughs> so why Roger looks so effortless is he's put so much work in, especially from a young guy, to where his technique is flawless on everything he does. And his footwork is flawless. And he's... He's worked on moving like that, which is another thing that I want to look at Ken Rosenberg, take my neck. I love that guy. <laughs> and he's so right. That's yeah. the thing. He's so smart. Yeah. And um, he just mentioned you, uh, Kenneth, when we were chatting earlier before this. So yeah, yeah. He liked the, he, he bought the he bought the pass because of my Farley impression. Maybe I'll bring it back again tonight. Um, sure. so, so anyway, uh, where was oh so Roger's footwork is effortless because he's worked so hard on it. And it's one of those things that you have to work on off the court. And if you look at a lot of his videos, when he's a younger guy, he, he was doing lots of different things out there, you know, jumping off trampolines and then going into a return of serve. There's a really cool video when he's about, it looks like 15 or 16 showing all the work he's doing. And then another thing that I think is a good copy, though, especially for our age, a lot of people watching this are over 40 and uh, 40, 50, 60. And one thing I know is that Roger does with his workouts is he does a lot of um, it's like almost high intensity interval training, but not that intense. And he does short bursts of stuff. Go watch his workout in Dubai. And it's a great workout because he's getting a lot of stuff done. He's getting a lot of moves done, very tennis specific. But none. But I don't think any of us who did it would be overwhelmed. I think all of us could do it, which is really exciting. You know, I think all of us could have done that workout, and it was so thorough. It looks so relaxing and smooth, smooth and effortless. So I think doing that type of workout just kind of makes you feel good and float. So that's another thing. Awesome. A couple questions here, if you don't mind, Pete, or did you want to just go to the next one or? Well, let's do one more question, then we'll then we'll get on some more of my list. I've got I've still got quite a list to work on here, buddy. Love it. Yeah, appreciate that. A lot of value tonight. Um, wow, and we're already like fifty minutes in. That's crazy. So, uh, uh, Attic B. It's a great like rap name or group name. Um, but uh, are all great athletes, regardless of sport, always more like they are on the balls of their feet and never flat footed? I would say yes. Yeah. I would say yes. I mean, the Dow is not certainly flat footed. He's on the balls of his feet. It's just, I think some look like they're working harder at it. Like Nadal looks like he's beating up the court, you know, yeah. he's, smooth, he's smooth in his own right, but it's a different type of movement. It's, it's like, it's like, he's a Mack truck that's moving, you know, where Federer is, is like the Muhammad Ali. He's floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. But certainly I think all great athletes are, are on their toes. They're in the athletic foundation and they work at it. This doesn't happen by accident. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, awesome. Well, Pete, I will let you go on to the next do or don't. Okay. So here's another do. This is, this is a big one. This is a big one. 
Do take Rogers' attitude after the way after a loss. And I think mm. this is especially important yeah. for club players. You yeah. know, like yeah. I was talking about this with my girlfriend t- today. Actually, a lot of great champions, and I used to be this way too. When they, th- you know, Pete Sampras would say, "I like to win, but I hate losing." more than the, than the winning, you know, like uh, winning's great, but I hate to lose. I think Michael Jordan was kind of the same way. Like, like he wanted to win. He loved winning, but he really hated to lose a lot of great pros. They, they freaking hate losing. And, and uh, I don't think Roger particularly likes losing, but he gets over it really, really quick. He gets over it really, really quick. And I think that that's important because I don't think, most of us want to take pride being 40, 50, 60, being, yeah, I'm like, I'm like that. I'm like, I'm like McEnroe. I hate to lose. I hate it. Like if you're going to be that person at the club, you're going to be the person no one likes, you know, and you're not going to be playing for money. I'm not playing for money. None of us are good enough to be playing to where it should ruin our experience after the match to where we're like mean to our family and we're grumpy to strangers on the street, which I've seen some people be like that. You know, you're, 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 you're not nice to any of the club members. I've done that in the past in my twenties. No way. Oh yeah. I've done it. Maribon. It was, I, I had one of the most embarrassing. <laughs> you to tell this story. Yes, please. Oh God. This is one of the most embarrassing moments. So don't be this guy, which is this guy. Okay. I'm the director of the club, pretty popular director. I wasn't a director that some, you know, some directors, you know, they're like very, very social as far as like they drink around the club and they mm. like start to develop a certain, re- I was pretty straight laced and professional. Everybody liked me for the most part. They didn't like me. I didn't know about it, you know? So I was a popular director, usually had my temper intact. And this one particular tournament I played with, my girlfriend, Jessica, who was also a very, very good player. She was very good. She had amazing ground strokes, super duper fit. Um, her volleys, though, were not very good. And her overhead was not very good. And her serve was not very good. And we played our first round and we blew this one really good team off the court. We played excellent. So we thought like, oh, we're definitely going to, if we won that match, now the tournament's pretty much ours. Mm-hmm. And then we played this team that they were professionals at getting the ball back in play. Mm-hmm. And this one lady she had amazing hands. No matter what I served, I mean, usually when I serve the people, I get free points. She got everything back and she started to lob over Jessica's head and, and, and they started to, and then the guy had really good hands too. And he could, he could like push around, but then he could end the point too. So I kept saying to my girlfriend, like, it's okay. We're going to win. We're going to win. Then, then it starts to go where there's more tension between me and her. Cause we're not coming back. And then I start getting mad that we're not coming back. And I start putting more pressure on myself and start making more mistakes. Long story short, we lose. The deck above the court is all watching. It's a full deck. And I am so upset that we lost that I'm standing here and I go to chuck my racket into the net. It keeps elevating end over end, levitating through the air to where my opponent has to duck. Oh, yeah. The next thing is I was so upset with myself that I did that, that I lost my temper, but I'm still so heated. The guy goes, he picks up my racket, he brings it to me, he hands it to me. And I'm so mad at myself that my bag and my, and, and my bench is over here. I go to chuck my racket into, into, <laughs> into basically my area against the fence. And I just thought it would like drop, you know, around my back. Yeah. It hits it hits the, the wall and ricochets and lands up in his bag, the guy who oh. almost took his head off. So he had to then um, take the racket out of the bag and hand it to me. Well, I think, you know, the second one was merely a magic trick. So I, I don't fault you for that at all. And uh, no, but I, I really appreciate you um, just kind of showing that everybody's human and things mistakes are made, but you've obviously become a lot wiser and you don't do that anymore and like roger was the same where he had temper tantrums and now he does not so um appreciate that story wow i actually don't think i ever had like a really bad episode after that i was so embarrassed i drove i I was the guy who stormed off and about 20 20 to 30 minutes into our drive and 
me and my girlfriend are both really upset. Then we just started bursting up laughing about it. And then I just realized I, I can't, I can't do this ever again. This is ridiculous. So, you know, I love the way that Roger basically says, you know, hurting loses, but when I leave, it's over. I don't take it off the court. I don't use it against my family. We're still going to have a good time. And, and, he, and he's able to separate the two. So that's, that's a definite big do. Yeah. And did uh, Charlie's asking, Pete, did you buy him a beer after almost killing him? No, I was out of there. I was a little baby jerk. I literally just like left. I was so embarrassed and humiliated. I headed straight for the exit and drove away. Not a jerk, a baby jerk. I was a baby jerk. Different. Different. It's like, that's ultra jerk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I had a guy who I think we mentioned this in the previous stream, but, you know, I came back from like six, two, five, one, and then he just smashed all three of his rackets. And uh, you just don't want to do that. It's not not fun to look at. But, um, you know, everybody goes through it and you uh, you learn. So that's great. Um, let's see. Let's see if we have any questions here. I got one more. Don't. And then I'll be done. Wow. Don't yeah. stop. <laughs> <laughs> should i go for it you want to take one question oh i can take a question yeah go ahead okay, i appreciate go. that appreciate it yeah. yeah this one's a tough one that's pretty good by hj uh, cool shades man uh, i tried imitating roger especially on the serve but i feel that i did that because of his style so what i have my doubt about is how do you imitate your idol's shots and still play well like him not easy Okay, so here, here's here's how you can do it. You have to pick the pieces that are fundamentally perfect and great. Like you're mentioning a serve as actually one of the things on my list, but since we're running so long, I, I wasn't gonna get to it, but, but you gave me the opportunity to do that. Another do that Roger does that most pros do not. If, I mean, most most club players do not. If you could blow up this, the screen there for me so I can give a good visual on this. Yeah. Is, Roger on the serve gets himself into what I like to call the secret power source. If you look at him, his racket, his racket gets here. And this is a big power move for the serve. And lots of recreational players start to do this. And then they go into a bigger flop. And then they're in full pizza move. And then they're hitting. So, you know, everybody here wants to get them, get themselves into the secret power source. It's where you're bringing your racket. And again, you're staying on the same side, the same, you're this, the hitting side. And what dictates the time where you drop behind the head and go, it's when the leg drive happens. If you can't tell him a big fan of Rick Macy's coaching, and he basically says, you know, you want to get up in this position and hold here until your legs start to drive up. And then that dictates the racket drop. And if you watch a quarterback get ready to throw, they do the same thing. They're holding here in the secret power source. Yeah. And they're holding here. And then when they're going to explode their legs out and forward, this is when they, they go. So yeah. a lot of, a lot of recreational players, what do they do, they toss the ball up and they're here and the ball's gone. They're waiting for it. It's still on the way up. And then they lose all kinds of power and momentum. So that's what we want to copy. One of the things that you can do to become a better player, one of the big don'ts, and this is my last don't, don't, don't play the margins that Roger plays. You know, if you go out there and like, I'm going to play like Roger and I'm going to hit the ball. I, when I go watch Roger play, you can see that he clearly is going lower over the net than most players and hitting shots on a dime. You know, that, that one year when he was beating the Dow and he was hitting backhand winners up the line, they showed that like he literally almost had like zero spin on his backhand when he was driving <laughs> up the line. Sometimes it almost even had looked, appeared to have a little bit of a slight underspin to it. That's how flat he was hitting it down the line. And so, you know, we can't do that, okay? Unless, unless you're as talented as him, start at his age, and have as much hours to dedicate to the game as him, it ain't going to happen, you know? So when, when you're playing, you can have Roger's technique – but think of yourself more like clay court Roger, you know, stand a little further behind the baseline, hit the ball a little higher than that and put some air on it. I've seen Roger back up on some return of serves and put more spin on it. He can do it. He can hit that high, heavy ball. He just doesn't do it as much as like Roger does or Novak does, but he can do it. 
So you can take Roger's strokes, but add some more air under your ball. Hit the ball high over the net. Get a little more spin on it. Give yourself a little more time off the baseline. If you do all that and you use his fundamentals, you, you can use Roger strokes to your advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great job with that, Pete. Really appreciate that. Um, HJ, your question. What exactly is a secret power source? Is it like the, is it the lag position? No, it's not the lag position. The secret power source is what I was just showing you. It, it's, it's, it's so to me, I, I love sports. Okay. In fact, we're going to have a um, online summer camp for kids this this year. You can go to online summer camps with Pete.com and um, get three free days for your kids if you have any kids. So if, if you watch all professional athletes throw a ball, right, for power, especially let's just take the two biggest American sports, which is baseball and football, they get themselves into the secret power source, which is right here. You're not going to see uh, a quarterback or a pitcher do what a lot of recreational tennis players do, which is start and get like right here. See, imagine I'm a quarterback and I'm trying to throw a long bomb. How, how, how much power do I look like I have right now? Not, not much. much. Yeah. And a lot of recreational players, this is exactly what they do. I mean, how many times have you seen this? Yeah, a lot. Right? And, and so, but if you watch the quarterback get ready to throw, he's here. And this is the secret power source. Your elbow's relaxed. Look how the knuckles like, I mean, the, um, the wrist is a little like bowed forward. Kind of like to call this like the cobra move, like you're ready to attack, you know, and your wrist is loose and light and you're in here. And then when you see your target, bam, you release. Uh, same thing with the pitcher. Notice the pitchers are holding the, the ball in the glove. They're getting set. They're in the secret power source until they release. And if you watch like Andy Roddick, he had a big secret power source. Watch, watch him and watch, go to YouTube and watch him right after this live stream. After you buy Marabon's lifetime access pass, because it's the last night and he's got like seven bonuses. But um, you'll watch Roddick when he does his toss, he basically brings both arms up and stops in the secret power source and bends way down and then springs up to hit it. Roger Federer, again, he's got a great secret power source. They all do. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you really have to keep in mind that you know the sport. In the sport, it's so important for you to be using, getting that proper unit turn going, using your huge power sources like your hips and your your shoulders. You know, getting that great turn uh, like Pete showed, especially with the forehand in the very beginning, and uh, that that's where a lot of the power is going to come from. You know, even though we're hitting the stroke with our arms per se, you know, we're not really hitting it with it, we're, we're using the whole kinetic chain to, uh, to accomplish, um, hitting a great stroke. So yeah, mm -hmm. good stuff, mate. Um, let's see, we have a lot of questions come in. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, HJ has another one. Uh, how do we practice the trophy position? I tried it many times, but I end up hitting the ball on the tip of my racket and it goes flying into the fence when I serve. Hmm perhaps simplify it? Yeah. Well, one thing I like to do to get to get the time, I'd like to do a couple of different exercises and I'll share them right now if you'd like. Um, sure. So a couple of things I like to do is number one is even if you're going to eventually have where you like to drop past the shoelaces and then up into the secret power source, I like for people to really get their time by just starting here and starting the secret power source so you can really get it going, right? The, the tro you don't want to be in like a traditional like trophy pose like this. You don't want to really do that. You want to be here, right? And you're staying here and until your legs bend and then they start to explode up. Then you come back here and, and it's like you're, you're brushing your hair. You can, there's lots of different analogies that work really well. So I would start here and what I would first start to do is toss the ball up. And I would wait till it reached the peak. So when the ball came up and reached the peak and stopped, I would say stop. So I'd throw the ball up and I'd say stop, stop. And then once I see it kind of going there, I'm going to replace it with the word go. So once it gets there, I'm going to start saying go, go. And then, and then what I'm going to start to do is when I say go, then I'm going to let everything go and I'm going to explode my legs up. Another thing to really go into the correct racket drop if you're if that's what you mean by trophy position because a lot of people start to go into the frying pan move or the pizza move as i like to call it 
is look how my thumbnail starts to like point away from me. What you want to do is keep the thumbnail to where you can always see it. So I like people to do lots of shadow strokes where they're starting in secret power source and they don't look at the ball, right? They're just, this is why it's so great to be practicing at home right now. You just watch your thumbnail. It should always be the inside. You should always be able to see it. And then as I'm coming here, I can still see the thumbnail and then I start to release. <laughs> Let me get down here. All right. I'm coming here. I can see the thumbnail. I can see the thumbnails. It's passing here. And then I start to extend up and hit. Now all of a sudden I'm imparting some spin and then falling through. Nice. Nice. Thank you, Pete. Uh, oh, we can still see you. Good. Uh, oh, this is a good one from Zorana here. Um, you're hiding. <laughs> uh, few players, <laughs> few players that I coach and I have a pretty solid serve with approaching the back foot um, pinpoint. So would the change to platform stance be worth it? Oh, I wish we had a video of that, but um, what do you think about that, Pete? Few players I coach have a pretty solid serve approaching with the back approach. Oh, so they like slide the back foot up. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a preference. I mean, I, I've, I've gone from the platform to sliding up yeah. and, and overall, um, I have just preferred to like start wide, kind of like Goran Ivanisevic style, rock back and slide up. That that gives why I think people like the slide is it kind of gives you a nice little nice little rhythm. So I like the slide, and I've also used you know the the platform and the pinpoint. Um, but I think it's a personal preference. I don't think there's a right or wrong on that. Yeah, one tip that I do uh, remember hearing, uh, which is valid, of course, is from uh, Jeff Sosenstein, former top 100 player. And he also did a section on uh, Tennis Summit 2020, of course. It's uh, in the all-access pass area. But um, what he talks about is sometimes if you're having trouble um, rotating uh, and coiling, you might want to actually try the platform stance um, because it, it, it does uh, facilitate it a little bit better. And also it does simplify uh, the serve a little bit just because you have like one less moving part. So, I mean, those are just things to think about. But, you know, as Pete mentioned, a lot of people like the pinpoint because of the rhythm aspect. So, uh, I mean, you know, you could try it, of course, but, um, you know, you just want to analyze your serve and see what you end up liking better. And, um, yeah, so it's uh, not an easy question, but um, great summary from Pete on that. So, yeah, I think if people are having trouble with balance, you know, like, and to go, go to the, again, the platform might be good to destabilize the body, but some people really like that rhythm of it. And they're good enough athletes to, to do it, especially a lot of certain volleyers. I, I used to serve volley all the time. So I kind of, I kind of felt like that almost gave me like a running head start. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, let's see. Yeah. HJ said something about having trouble, um, in the platform and, I guess I wonder whether, whether I should switch the pinpoint. Yeah. I mean, again, just the same thing. It's going to be preference. And I mean, it's really important to also remember that you really want to be able to load the back leg so that you can get that power transfer as well. Um, so that's, um, yeah, another consideration. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, interesting. So Robert, um, when the pros are returning serve from a power player, say John Isner, a huge server on the backhand side, how do they prevent falling backwards? Well, we talked about this the other day. Um, I think it's a lot of your body position and your mindset. And we actually talked about this the other night in that a lot of players who are out there playing club tennis, they, they're standing like this, ready to return. Well, they're ready, they're ready to get blown back if someone's serving the ball um, hard. And you watch the, the pros – you want to you know think of yourself like a shortstop or also like a linebacker or a cornerback and you're seeing like a speeding bullet coming right at you and you've got to absorb and take this person to the ground if you if someone's run at you and you're like this they're going to knock you right over and go to the end zone you what do the football players do they get down like this and then they wait and they kind of work on the angle and then they go and they get you and they bring you down that's the same idea when you're going to return a serve you need to be down in here and as a serve toss is going up, even though it's intimidating and it's fast, you need to be going to that speeding bullet. And that's why your first move needs to be so simple and not a big turn and not a big racket back, because then you're not going to be able to handle that. You, you need to be here. And then as the ball is coming, you're pushing forward 
and just going to meeting the ball out in front. And if you're here with your chest leaning in, your booty kind of out, and you're pushing in, now you can take that power and use it against them. That's why sometimes some of the biggest serves you've ever seen in your life, the return's even bigger than that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, really good stuff there. Uh, let's see here. We got a, you got a favorite player? Uh, oh, actually, no, sorry. Before I go into that, I wanted to mention that um, with the, uh, the, the serve return, just a fantastic session by Greg Lesur from Online Tennis Instruction, showing you exactly what you need to do um, with the upper body and the unit turn and so forth, as well with what to do on the footwork, um, which is very, you know, pretty much exactly what Peter mentioned. And so Greg takes you step by step into exactly how to execute and, and practice a proper uh, return. And that's an amazing session. He always does great work. And that's part of the uh, Tennis Summit All Access Pass as well there. Um, which expires tonight. It does expire tonight. And we're going to talk about like some huge bonuses that are exclusive, um, for tonight actually. So, yeah. uh, let's see. Did you want to take a couple more? What do you think? Well, I'll give one more piece of advice for yeah. everybody staying at home. Uh, one thing that's been kind of going viral is Roger Federer's wall practices. And I think, a lot of people who got good at tennis grew up hitting against the wall. I, I loved to hit against the wall when I was growing up and, and I'd play matches against the wall and I do all kinds of drills against the wall. Mirabon, I'm sure you were the same way. And Roger, I've heard him say this for a long time, even before this whole crazy pandemic, I remember listening to him years ago and he says, I always like to stay sharp. He's like, even if I have a, if I have a little sabbatical away from the game, I'm never fully away from the game, which a lot of people in this um, pandemic, they've chosen to kind of go, well, I can't really get better unless I'm on a tennis court. And I just see it the complete opposite way, especially it's been proven to me with our 30 day tennis technique and fitness challenge. And Roger says, you know, he'll, he'll just, you know, go out and serve against the wall for a little while, or, or, or you see how he practices his volley against the wall. I don't know if you guys seen that, that video, it's amazing, but you know, Roger's still working on his skills, even though he's not on a court. And I, I even got to talk to a karate guy today, a karate coach for our, for our online summer camp. And I said, you know, I just love the way that you guys teach because of the sport. No one wants to go in there in combat on the first day and start hitting, hitting each other. And the guy laughed. He's like, oh, God, no. And, and he's like, yes, we teach the technique first. The, the kids, the adults who take a karate class, they have to learn the moves first before they can start even thinking about sparring. So it was kind of confirmed that I've always said this, but it was confirmed by actually talking to a karate coach today. And he says, that's a big mistake. I mean, it was all his words. And he's saying the same thing I've been saying. It's like, it's a big mistake. You know, when kids start, you know, even playing basketball and shooting, shooting the basket right away and doing lots of, lots of things right away that we all want to do. You know, we all, you start playing tennis, naturally you want to hit the ball. But now is a great uh, time, and, and I think we're kind of coming out of this. Hopefully more and more people will be able to get on the court. But now is a great time to self-study and learn that what you're doing without the tennis ball, if it's not perfect, it ain't going to work until the ball comes. It's just not. Okay, So you've got to decide what kind of tennis player you want to be, and both are fine. I, I think a lot of Tennis players, especially when it's like 3-0, 3 5, they're scrappers. It's like it's like they're in a street fight and they beat you up with no technique, just like Will Hart uh, fighting dirty and yep. they can beat you up, right? But yep. then somebody who's like a martial artist, they're beating you with the art of of fighting. Like they've made it an art form. It looks good, it is good, it's 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 more effective when you're able to do it at a high level. And so if you want to be that type of tennis player because tennis is also very artistic it's an art form there's an art to it there's a science to it if you want to be that player more than you just want to win you need to really dive deep into studying the art of tennis and a big part of the development of tennis is doing that in tennis ball. for sure pete i mean I think, you know, I was thinking about this today and I just um, almost got excited. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's the right wording, but 
just at the opportunity to really be off the, the, the tennis court in the sense of not having the pressure of having to play in a competitive environment, because now I can just do my shadow swings. I can figure out, figure out like in my strokes, what's going on. I, I, you know, for example, one thing I noticed was that I, I wasn't getting as good of a racket drop on my backhand, my two-handed backhand as I could. So now is the time to just practice that over and over and over again. And uh, now is the time, like Pete said, to just really think about your game, write down your your career goals and aspirations, figure figure out uh, you know what you need to do to get there, figure out what resources uh, you need to study to get there as well. Um, you know, one resource is of course um, the Tennis Summit All Access Pass because you're getting over 30 of the world's best coaches uh, on the planet uh, teaching you on court lessons, point analysis sessions, and uh, master classes on uh, on singles and double strategy, technique, fitness, and the mental game. And we're going to throw in some huge bonuses, actually exclusive to should, uh, to this stream. Should we tell them now? Yeah, let's should tell them right. out of the back. So, yeah, if you've been reading my emails, you have not seen this, but on the live streams, because I just respect you guys. It's like amazing that you guys are here. And we're going, what? We're going 136 deep, 945 at night. We just sent out the email earlier today and you guys are there. So I've been giving away this crazy bonus on the live stream. So I'm going to do it one more time. I haven't put in any email. I'm not going to. In fact, I'm not e emailing anymore tonight. This is, this is it. So if you're watching this tonight, I've been doing what I have been calling these challenges. We've been doing a seven day serve challenge. It was pretty awesome where people every day you're learning a different aspect of the serve from a perfect practice to a slice serve, to a kick serve, to placement, to patterns that you want to be using. Very, very detailed instruction on the serve. And people are able to then send me their video through this amazing app called video ass that I've been using that is so powerful. And um, it's just such a great thing. I'll show you, I'll show you guys this and I'll let you guys send in videos after this for like seven to 10 days. If you sign up, you can, you can get on the video ask and send in your videos. Then we did a, a, a seven day ATP. And again, I use ATP lightly. I really think that it's changed that the WTA players are using the same technique. It's just how the forehands evolve. And so we go through that. And the first day we were learning the ATP Rick Macy forehand then the next day we're working on top spin. Then the next day we're working on mastering the mid court and also our inside out forehand, crushing it like a rocket ship. Uh, we're working on, on our footwork one day, like the different forehand footwork patterns so you can stay on offense. And then we have a perfect forehand practice template that kind of ties all seven days in. And again, people were sending in their videos. I'll share the screen here in a minute because I'm just so proud of it. And then the last thing we've been doing, which has just been the best thing we've, we've done. And again, what's kind of cool is when you're in time of adversity, you get creative, you believe what you believe. And it's always been my thought that people can really improve a lot off the court and not everybody buys into that. But the people who bought into this challenge, I showed them beyond a shadow of a doubt how much you can really study your technique and improve it because people are always, always um, learning from every video that they send in and they look different. They've improved through the 30 days. The camera does not lie. So um, you guys can get all three of these challenges tonight. Tonight only when you sign up. Like basically when Maribon wakes up and it's all closed, he's not going to send you the, the registration link. So it's basically like when Maribon wakes up, he's like the timer. It's like a soccer game. It's like when he, when he calls time, it's over. He's not going to give it away anymore, which will be sometime tomorrow morning. So whenever the cart closes, um, it won't be available anymore. And so you want to sign up Maribon. Maybe you can put the, the pass, uh, the, the link there or tell people where to go. And I want to share this. First of all, let me get my video ask up. Um, let me get this up here because it's just so cool. I want to I show you guys this because I'm so proud of it. And what, what I really love about it too, definitely do our, our Tennis Terminator Challenge next so you can start in the beginning with it because we develop um, a hell of a relationship uh, with it to where you know people are, and I'll show you, people are bringing on their dog on camera like on a daily basis. Um, it's just really, really cool 
uh, how much we're sharing. Ken's been a big part of it, who's on all our live calls. And of course, the video ask is not loading up. I'm trying to load it up and it's it's not because it because this technology is so evil. So I might not be able to show this to you. Oh, here it comes. Just loading extremely slow. Lots of times when you when you're on a live stream, I think it just slows down the technology of other things, uh, which is kind of weird. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know why. But let me just. No worries. Just, let me just. No sure. Okay, it's coming up. Okay, okay. Now it went away. Okay, I finally got it up, and then it went away. Maribon, I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> it's all good. But I do really want to show people. Yeah, I'll just look at some questions while you uh, check it out. Okay. Attic. Okay, right. cool. They oh, actually yeah. right up there. We'll play Ken's thank you for everybody if it if it plays. Hold, hold on. Um, let me. This will be a surprise because I haven't I haven't seen this yet. Um, can you share the screen or do I need to share the screen? Yeah, I got You're it. Sharing the screen. Cool. Yep. Here we go. Okay. Can you guys see this? I could see it. You guys see it? Uh, okay, cool. So so this is everybody sending me their videos every day. And and I'm analyzing their videos and we're coming back and forth. So we'll just play Ken's and let's just see what he says. We'll play it for a little bit. I don't and Maribon, maybe you can tell me if you can't hear it, but here we go. Wow, Pete. Wow. All I can say is wow. <laughs> But not about your singing. It's about the course. This was, it was fantastic, man. It was great. It was the best way for me to be locked down for a month. I mean, I kind of almost forgot about it. And I've never would have had the opportunity to work as hard at tennis. There's so many other commitments in my life. So it was, it was fabulous. I just have to learn to relax, you know? And even today, I learned about the wristband. That's incredible. Push my arm out, wristband, that stuff. Invaluable. It's it's. Thank you so much. I really do. All right. So it's not playing the best, but but I think you guys can tell he's pretty happy. He's pretty yeah. satisfied. And 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 here's here's uh, one of my favorite little. See, so this becomes like a story when you guys. I mean, and and the story really is a relationship. Let me let me go here. One two. Look three, at this. He's showing three, his dog. Peter. He's singing to me. A free. Um, Good times never seem so good. Because I sang to them this morning. <laughs> I sang the end of the road. So like we're, de you can see guys, we're developing like real relationships. And um, let me see if I can find one where I analyzed it. Maybe this is, uh, but anyway, yeah, you, you guys see this? These are all, they can, people can send audio. They can send text messages. They can send videos. And every time you see me appear, I'm coming back to coach you up. Wow. It's just, it's just awesome. So that's what you can do for the next seven to 10 days. If you sign up, you can send me your videos within a grace period. I am moving on to the 14 day ter tennis terminator. So it's not like I, you can't send the videos to me for like the next 30 days. I, I, that, you know, I just can't do that, but I'll give you like a seven to 10 day grace period to try this out after you get, and you'll get all three of those challenges and you'll own them for, for life. Um, and the way it goes is you'll basically, you can stop sharing your screen now, Maribon. The, sure. the way it works is, is you get your lesson and then you get me giving you the challenge and then you send in your video here or whatever you want to say to me. And then we just build this amazing relationship inside of this. And it's the most powerful teaching I've ever done ever. It's freaking unreal. It's so awesome because I just love getting to know my students. They're just amazing people. Love it. Love it, Pete. That's that's amazing. And so, um, obviously, everybody, if you go to uh, tennisfilesummit.com slash Pete Upgrade, then you will get these bonuses from Pete, which is definitely well worth it. Um, you know, just by alone, like even the ability to get to send Pete, you know, such a great coach, uh, USPTA, I believe, uh, Pro of the Year in Georgia, to be able to send him videos and to have him give you his feedback. That's like a lesson right there already. But I mean, you get all that, plus you get um, the all access pass. Uh, and then should I transition to what I'm uh, giving as well, uh, Pete, at this point? No. no, no. You're a tough cookie, my friend. Of course you should. Yeah. So what I'm giving away, if you get the uh, Tennis Summit 2020 all access pass, which includes lifetime access to all of this year's summit videos, also, MP3 audio files that you can download and listen to anytime you want. 
Also, the transcripts to every single episode, to every single session so that you can read them anytime you want, an implementation guide to help you take notes on the most important things in these lessons, uh, and also uh, special offers as well, and uh, a membership to the uh, Facebook community, our mastermind area, and uh, some special re resources as well. So that's a lot of stuff. It's really a mouthful. If you get that all access pass this year, you're going to also get Tennis Summit 2, which is a, another summit for you with even more amazing lessons for you. So you're, you're stocking your library double if you sign up tonight. Um, and not only that, you're also going to get my top 10 podcast interviews. So for those of you that don't know, uh, I, I have a podcast on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, Tennis Channel Podcast Network. That's and nice, yeah. It's called the Tennis Files Podcast. And so I interview some amazing people. Like I've had James Blake on. I've had Rick Macy on. I've had Nick Boletari on. So just so many people. Pete, of course, a couple times. And so you're, if you sign up today, it's it's just like a banger of a deal. Like you are getting, you know, the tw Tennis Summit 2020 All Access Pass, which just the videos alone, having lifetime access to that is already more than worth much more than the price you're paying but then you get all those bonuses and then on top of that you'll get tennis summit two you'll get 10 podcast interviews and then you'll get all peace challenge bonuses and ability to send your your video stim so by my calculations that's like 80 billion dollars i mean obviously <laughs> it kind of is that's crazy i mean it's crazy when you think about it yeah and it's great it is it and is. i can tell you because i do the tennis con and it takes months and months and months, right? I mean, you're you're getting all these people to agree to these interviews and 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 making content for you. You're yeah, just sign up, says Ian. Exactly. And so you're 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 getting you're chasing all these people down. They're great to work with, by the way. Ian, you're great to work with. I love you, Ian. Yeah. Essential, um, awesome yeah. place to go. Great. Yeah, but. But it is it is work. You gotta you gotta schedule all this stuff out. You gotta get the content. You gotta edit it. You gotta put it. I mean, it takes months and months of work making all the web pages, making sure everything runs off without a hitch or at least as few hitches as possible. And then when Maribon saying that he's doing the audio, all the audio transcripts, and then also all the written transcripts, I literally wanted to slap him in the face because I'm like. <laughs> Now I've got to do that. I don't want to do that. That's like so <laughs> tedious. It's a nightmare. Like, right. no, Maribon, don't give everybody all the audios too and the transcripts. Like, come on. Because now I'm going to feel guilty if I don't do it. And I just feel like he's a jerk and he's showing me up because that's not something I, I want any part of. But yet he does it for you guys. So that's awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Pete. I mean, you know, we, we just love giving you all value. I mean, we understand, obviously, People are working hard for for um, their money, and they want to get good value for what they're paying. And so, uh, you know, and we're making all these uh, free videos for you, and we just want to pack as much as we can into into the the products and content that we make for you. That's why we're giving you, you know, not one but two different summits for the price of one, plus the podcast interviews, and then the challenges from Pete. It's really a uh, great value. It's pretty much a no brainer. That's um, that's what I think it is. So. Uh, yeah, and and so we have the banner, or we don't have it up at this moment, but we'll we'll put it up in a second for you all. Um, and and uh, yeah, I really highly encourage. Oh God, just buy the boys' pass. Just buy his lifetime access pass. <laughs> oh man, my yeah, we have um, Farley, my Chris Farley's back. That's what made Ken buy the other day. He liked my Farley. That's if you haven't never seen this, look it up on on YouTube. Chris Farley and like. Um, and, and Adam Sandler, Adam Sandler wants to like be a house sitter for you while you're on vacation. He's begging to be a house sitter. He's like, please let me, please let me water your plants. And then Chris Farr is like, will you just let the boy water your plants? So just buy his pass. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, this, this offer, uh, it's, I certainly not something that I have ever done before. And, uh, you know, Pete is offering like amazing value as well. So, um, but this is a limited offer. I mean, the the all, all access pass, excuse me, is uh, expiring uh, tonight. So to tonight. say that you can't get it after um, midnight, I believe, uh, Pacific time next yeah. year. Yeah, two thousand twenty-one. You want to wait all the way to two thousand twenty-one? 
Come yeah. On, Matt. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you right now, like you're never going to get like this type of bonus, like for, for a long time, <laughs> if ever, if ever, because this is like the biggest bonus package I've seen. Until my tennis con, because you're going to give an awesome bonus too, right? You've already, you're already planning your bonus for tennis. I'm already planning my bonus. I mean, you know, you're such a great guy and you're giving, you know, for, for my audience and, and everybody. And so I have to do the same for you. Um, you know, that's how I feel. And, you know, I've got to say just a step back that like Pete, he just gives and gives so much. Like I, if you follow him, he's, he's streaming like every day, almost he's putting out YouTube videos so much. And so, you know, people like Pete and Ian, who you've seen here uh, and, and Will and, you know, so many, you know, some, some of these other instructors they're they're really putting a lot of the hard yards into, to really give you uh, the content that you need to improve your game because um, you know, that that's what makes us happy is to, that you're improving. And I can tell you right now, there's nothing that Pete loves more to hear back from people like you, players like you, coaches no. like you, um, to say, "Hey, wow! I you told me that backhand tip, and I used it today, and and it's working so well. Like that's the best feeling." It so, is. yeah, yeah, it's so, fun. yeah. So everybody, um, just highly encourage you to take uh, advantage of um, the this amazing deal at tennisfilesummit.com/slash/pete upgrade. Be sure to check the link out, and we'll paste it here. And then you can get um, you can get two all access passes for the price of one. You get um, the tennis uh, the uh, tennis files podcast top ten interviews, and you get Pete's challenges as well. So definitely take advantage of that. After midnight Pacific tonight, it's not going to be available anymore. So and Mary Bond's going to send give give you a car too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What'd you say? Give him your what card? You're, you're giving away a car too tonight. Oh, a car, yes. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, it's a, it's actually a Toyota. <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> just just ask for the t <laughs> to get the, the tennis con uh, ten tennis summit too is good enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tennis summit too is good enough, guys. If I can't buy y'all cars. So mm -hmm. um, so guys, get the lifetime access pass. Any other words of wisdom, Pete, um, as far as like helping players improve their game? I I think it, it's it's something to where if you want to keep growing, you just keep going, and that's what this is all about, you know. So I I think um, you know like one thing that Rick Macy actually mentioned when he was being interviewed is he thinks students should you know some people. So you shouldn't hear a lot of different voices. Rick Macy happens to believe you should hear a lot of different opinions and, and certain things that people say all of a sudden will trigger, you know, something in you, whether it's a technical thing you want to change, whether it's a thing that gets you excited about the game again. Um, I think when you always have things to look forward to and things to dive into, it's, it's just good for the mind. Uh, so I just want to congratulate you on, on putting it together again for everybody. And, and thanks so much for, for all your work. Thank you, Pete. Thanks for your work as well. Um, you have some great comments here. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Mirban and Pete Farley. Love that. That's amazing. So, okay. uh, thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, yeah, Charlie, Piro, Kenneth. Uh, yeah, so again, get the all access pass. Highly recommend it. Um, great bonuses uh, expiring tonight, uh, midnight. Uh, Pacific time and Pete, do you want to? Um, do you want to? Ken wants you to sing us out. So, oh my God, no, Ken, no, I can't do that for that. Was just for our, that was just for our membership. I sang the end of the road and it was just like it was awful. And uh, I can't, I what, what, what should we sing? Mirabon, will you sing with me? Yeah, I'll sing with you. What, what, what should we sing? Uh, what country road? I don't know. <laughs> How about this? We are the champions, my friend. Do you know that? You know that song? Oh yeah, I do, but I don't really know the lyrics. That's it. That's all I'm giving. I'm just giving a one line. I'm done. Okay. Okay. I was yeah, painful enough. I'm starting yeah. to sweat. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> no, you're amazing. Uh, American Idol, here you come, Pete. Mm. Uh, Billy Joel, Brad. I don't know any Billy Joel. Haven't you watched anything? No, I know you. <laughs> next stream. Next stream, we'll do that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Your support it does not go unnoticed. And uh, we want you to please stay safe and keep trying to improve every day 1%, even without being able to go on a tennis court for many of you. Uh, you still have the opportunity to do shadow swings. You still can uh, work on your fitness. You can still eat healthy. 
Um, you can still work on your footwork. So there's a lot of things that you can do and, uh, and just stay positive and, uh, you know, hopefully things will shore up soon. And, uh, again, take advantage of that lifetime access, uh, pass, uh, with the amazing bonuses from Pete and I, and, uh, can't, can't appreciate uh, you all enough. So thank you, Pete, for all your hard work. And, uh, you'll be hearing from both of us very soon and kudos to you, Pete, for a great session tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. You all have a great night. All right. See you all. Take care. <laughs>